Steve, I've often felt and, and thought that those uh, coaches, uh, those big recruiters uh, from Big Ten country in particular and some of the other schools, let's say in the ACC, Boston College and others, have to just be hoping and praying and hitting their knees the night before that they bring in some of these recruits from the South or uh, California and just hoping they know that they're not going to get 72 degrees in the middle of January or February, but Hey, give us, give us 40 degrees and some sun and, and we'll try to like get them in the buildings quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, they're now letting guys take official visits, I think in the spring of their junior year, which, uh, they can come in for a spring game weekend, which is usually good weather middle of April in Ohio uh, for years, it's obviously been predominantly uh, last week in November for the Michigan game, uh, which can be hit or miss. Some years it's in the 50s and some years it's in the 30s. And then uh, December and January typically are, are the worst two months weather-wise uh, here in central Ohio. We don't quite get the lake effect snow that Cleveland gets. They, they may get six or eight inches and we might get a dusting sometimes. But the weather is obviously not uh, conducive to bring in players from all over the uh, country uh, to uh, to visit at Ohio State. But the calendar is what it is. And uh, if kids are serious about playing uh, college football at the highest level, then they give places like Notre Dame, Michigan, Penn State, Ohio State up here in the Rust Belt. Uh, a, a look, I suppose, because, um, you know, you can get to a playoff, you can get to the NFL uh, from all of those places just as easily. Absolutely. It just doesn't seem like it affects Ohio State recruiting. So regardless of when they bring them in, and I know that Big Ten coaches have pushed for those later dates, some of those May recruiting visits and recruiting weekends, but it certainly has not affected uh, Urban Meyer in particular, and before him, Jim Tressel, in bringing in the top talent in the country. And I think I noted something that I came across a few weeks ago when we were talking recruiting and, and Urban Meyer's prowess that he was able to bring in more top 300 players from the state of Florida uh, in his last four or five years than Florida, Florida State, and Miami combined. Yeah, it's crazy. I know uh, when we did that breakdown, I, I looked at state by state uh, the makeup of this team, 85 guys, 31 of them are from the state of Ohio, so 37%, which in Trestle's time, he would generally take 50-50. It would be if he had a class of 20 guys, 10 of them would invariably be from Ohio, give or take, and 10 of them would be from out of state. Uh, Ohio State has nine guys from the state of Florida on scholarship. They also have guys, uh, several from states like Texas, Georgia. Um, Maryland is also another popular one right now. So uh, those are all states. Michigan has been in years past, but as of right now, I think they're down to only one guy from the state of Michigan on their roster. So uh, perhaps that has something to do with, um, you know, perhaps Jim Harbaugh is starting to find a way to keep some of the best players in Michigan back there at home. But um, it is interesting. I think they have guys from 15 or 16 different states in places like the state of Washington. Uh, they have Brandon Bowen, I believe is from Utah. Uh, they've got guys uh, from all over the map, basically. Uh, they'll have guys from Arizona coming in. Uh, Haskell Garrett and Tate Martell is not there anymore. They were both from Nevada, which is very rare as well. So, um, you know, I think it, it remains to be seen with Ryan Day. I don't think you're going to get back to 50-50 like you have with Trestle. But my guess it will be a happy medium between what uh, Urban Meyer was doing in the 30% range and what Trestle was doing closer to 50%. It'll probably be – in that 40% range for guys from the state of Ohio. And Ryan Day in recent weeks has been spotted at several of what we here consider to be the best talent producing high schools in the state of Ohio. Dublin Kaufman uh, is one of them right here in Columbus. Uh, Pickerington Central is another one. A lot of guys have come out of Pickerington Central and Pickerington North talking about, you know, Elf Line, and Taco Charlton, and uh, any number of guys, uh, the Bourne brothers who played at Ohio State, uh, a lot of guys that are now playing at Michigan State and Kentucky and, and all these other places uh, have come through that one suburb here in Columbus, and Ryan Day has made sure to get out there and press the flesh 
uh, Cincinnati and the Catholic schools, Moeller, Elder, St. X, have a deep tradition of producing guys who are playing at Penn State, Notre Dame, Kentucky, Ohio State in the past and different places. And as we mentioned, Jacob James uh, from Elder High School is uh, committed now for 2020. The Buckeyes uh, have a commitment as well from um, a, a kid uh, from St. X High School, St. Xavier, uh, also Paris uh, Johnson uh, for next year, 2020 prospect, national top 10 kid, offensive lineman, and they'll be fighting until next December when it's time for him to sign. They'll be fighting everybody off uh, to maintain him. I know Penn State and uh, Notre Dame and other schools are going to be coming in uh, for Paris Johnson, no question about it. We're on the line with Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts. You can join him right there for the best in Ohio State football coverage, the uh, 247 Sports platform for Ohio State. And he is senior Big Ten writer right there. Steve, I made a number of notes. Uh, you hit on so many things and some really good stuff there. Um, you made the character uh, argument in regards to evaluating these players. And, and just think about it. Not to pick on Randy Moss, but he's the first guy that came to mind as a guy that um, had some issues uh, in his collegiate career, moved on to three different universities, and obviously it turned out for him, he's one of the greatest of all time. But if you got a guy that's here in talent and you're grading somebody else here and this guy has a track record of issues, well, depending on which way he goes, he could maintain that that talent edge. Or if he busts, <laughs> then he goes from 100 to zero, where the other guy you, you got the character in play and it and it's pretty much locked down and then he may not become quite the player but at least you know you got a serviceable impact player on your team so it's it's obviously a a hit or miss situation with some of these guys yeah no question about it and uh, you know i think it's a reliability issue as well um you know i think that uh uh, you're looking for guys who can fit into a system, mesh into a team format. Uh, your team is together, and I joke about this all the time, 56 weeks a year, basically. I mean, you think about the off time for these guys in between semesters. Uh, I mean, they played in the bowl game on January 1st, and school began on January the 7th. And these are guys that got to go home for five days at Christmas time. They were practicing for the Michigan game on Thanksgiving Day. I mean, there is very, very little downtime when you are a Division I athlete uh, like you are at Ohio State. It is literally year-round commitment. Uh, they'll have spring break for a week coming up. Uh, it's, it's unique what they do because of their academic calendar. The semester for the winter semester is over April 30th. Done with exams. There's nothing in the month of May uh, pertaining to the winter semester. They have a truncated what they call May semester where you can stack up on some hours and in a four week period, uh, gain a whole semester's worth of a class or two, uh, which are obviously longer class times in those four weeks. But, um, the gist of it is that, uh, you know, a lot of the athletes will stay in Columbus for that period and continue working out, take a week off and come back and go through class and workouts for summer semester, which begins about the second week of June. So and then from there, they get a week off right before the start of preseason camp in August. And as we said, it's all the way through uh, till you get five days off of Christmas, five days off after your bowl game and you start right back in on it. So what did I tell you right there that they might get the equivalent of a month away from campus in the time of an entire year? And uh, it's not much, and it's broken up into five days here, seven days here, and it's that commitment level that you're looking for. Uh, and these kids, I think some of them go into it and they don't understand that commitment level coming from the high school uh, level. I think it depends on the structure a lot of times and the level of caliber of competition of their high school. Some of the places we talked about, St. X, Elder, they have programs in place like this where you show up at school at five in the morning and lift weights and then go to class, I mean, or after school or whatever it may be. And those kids probably have a better appreciation of what they're getting into at Ohio State than maybe some kids who are kind of the diamond in the rough kids who don't have that type 
of a program structure in place at some of their schools. It's, it's hard to say, but kids are coming from all walks of life. And um, again, what you're looking for are people that will be there in the 13th month when it's time when a championship is on the line, 14th game, fourth quarter, you know, are we going to win this game to get to the championship game or are we uh, just going to go play it and also ran bowl somewhere or whatever? So I think uh, that that special breed of cat is, uh, is what, is what they're looking for guys who have uh, goals in mind uh, to get their education, to play professionally, uh, to be part of a team framework, to be part of a brotherhood that will last them a lifetime. That's what, uh, coaches at Michigan, at Ohio State, Notre Dame, all these places are looking for that guy who's going to have that level of buy-in uh, to uh, to make his teammates look great and in turn uh, enjoy some of the, uh, the, uh, the largesse that comes with that. Because, um, you know, Urban Meyer says it a lot, you know, be sure that you're using the system and the system is not using you. That's what he kind of imparts to his players a lot of the time. And uh, they have to avail themselves of everything that's out there in terms of uh, class scheduling and tutoring and help and whatever else they can get, uh, you know, uh, preparation for life after football, all that. Uh, he talks about it all the time. And I think the guys who are leaving Ohio State, you have guys like Terry McLaurin. Uh, he graduated from Ohio State in three and a half years. He has a list of accomplishments a, while, a mile long that when he goes into interviews at the Senior Bowl with the Patriots, the Packers, the Bengals, the Browns, whoever it may be, his hometown team, the Colts, but he'd love to play for them, um, and Andrew Luck, uh, he can tell them, these are the things I've accomplished. This is the stuff I did on the field. This is the stuff I did off the field. And it's prepared him for that moment. Yeah, as you mentioned, Urban Meyer has certainly talked, especially more so in recent years, but he he admits to have learned a lot from his previous coaching stints, especially at Florida. And he he takes great pride, you know better than I do, takes great pride in the structure there at the Ohio State University in preparing these um, these kids for adult life if they are willing to buy in and take advantage of everything that's given them. But he believes that they have as great a structure that's being copied across the country to, um, to prepare these, uh, these kids for life. Yeah. He, he came about this because his two daughters were college volleyball players and his son is now playing baseball at Cincinnati. Uh, I, I want, I know that one of the daughters played at Georgia tech. I'm not sure if the other one played at Florida or at another college, but at any rate, they went through the recruiting process with each of their kids and as part of that, as a parent, he realized the shortcomings that he as a football coach wasn't wasn't meeting the needs of his own athletes in his football program. So it was like we were all geared around getting him a degree and shoving them out the door is kind of like an assembly line. Next, you know, give me the next batch, the next wave, get them their degrees, send them either off, you know, NFL or get their degree and shove them out the door and bring the next one in. He said, took more of a holistic approach to it that um, you have to uh, <clears throat> take these kids, some of them from uh, backgrounds where maybe they don't uh, have all this information, uh, explain to them that when you talk to people, you look them in the eye, this is how you interview, uh, this is what you wear, this is where you go, this is what you put on a resume, this is the thing that you do to build your resume. Uh, these are the people you need to see uh, to get counseling about what your field will be like. A lot of these guys want to go in, as he says, they want to ma uh, major in business. Well, they get to Ohio State, they don't even understand what that really means, that there's so many different facets to that college and different career paths that they can put people on. So, uh, you know, I think that, uh, his Real Life Wednesday program is the thing that he really came up with that uh, has knocked it out of the park. Uh, Ohio, you know, Columbus is, I want to say, number 30 in terms of television markets. But the city proper is probably the 10th or 15th largest city in the country. It just it doesn't have the suburban support that maybe Cleveland or some of the larger metro markets have. But there are major employers right here in Columbus 
who are dying, uh, first, to find great people, and second, to be part of something at Ohio State. You think the CEO at Nationwide Insurance isn't excited to say, oh, I was hanging out with Urban and the team the other day, and I was showing them this, and they were saying, oh, my goodness, that. And, you know, so they built that kind of kinship, I suppose, with local businesses. And uh, as he said, colleges around the country have taken note of it and uh, going to use the built-in advantages that they have in different parts of the country uh, to uh, to provide a similar service for their athletes. And again, you know, this is the year 2019. There's so much out there about student athlete welfare and uh, helping these kids, you know, tr transcend and make a leap within, you know, it's not just entertain everybody on television every Saturday. It's get something truly tangible out of this a college degree and a conduit to something that can set you up for life. And I think that's what uh, he's trying to accomplish. John Simon comes to mind uh, based on our conversation last week before the AFC championship game and, and uh, some other comments that you made right here, including who's going to be that guy that's going to be fighting when he's tired and banged up and hurting when it's uh, five minutes left to play against Michigan and uh, you're down by a touchdown. And John Simon embodies that. Also an adage that, again, I defer to you because you know so much more about Ohio State football and the happenings from day to day. But Jim Tressel would say, if anything, I would lean toward the Ohio guy because I just felt as though he probably would fight for his state, for his state school not to discount all the talent that they had from out of state, including Terrell Pryor at the top of the list that did an exceptional job at Ohio State and not saying that they didn't fight and play 100%, but there was just that philosophy that maybe the Ohio guy fights a little bit more, more for it. We talked about John Simon yeah. last week. We mentioned him, and uh, lo and behold, he comes up with a big play in the AFC Championship game. I think he had a sack early in that game, and I Definitely. thought, Steve and I just talked about him. Yeah, I think... Um, this is something that's come up in the last couple of years. Last year, they had two losses, uh, lost at home to Oklahoma, no disgrace in that. They were the Big 12 champion. Ohio State had won on Oklahoma's field the year before. So, um, you know, two great programs head to head, anything can happen. But the way that they lost the second game at Iowa was a disqualifying factor, I think, when it came time for them to be considered for the playoff. This year, all things being equal, you could say Oklahoma had a better loss to Texas early in the season and avenged that loss later in the year. I didn't have a problem that they put Oklahoma into the playoff and that Ohio State uh, losing uh, at Purdue 49-20 uh, to 20, the way that they lost again, was a disqualifying factor. What are the mitigating circumstances of those two losses? Is it endemic of the fact that you have guys from all across the country wearing this Ohio State uniform that may or may not have that buy-in that in a blowout situation they don't – maybe you still get in the playoff. I don't know. You at least have a better case. Uh, so it was the margin and the feel of those two losses – cost them two playoff berths, basically. And uh, some people in these parts have tracked it back to the number of out-of-state players and not having the proper buy-in, uh, not enough Ohio guys. But here's the trade-off. If I'm not taking out-of-state guys who are national top 100 guys, uh, am I even in that position to be considered for a playoff? If I don't have uh, K.J. Hill from Arkansas and J.K. Dobbins from Texas and uh, Chase Young, uh, you know, from Maryland and all these other guys, am I even in position for a, uh, a playoff berth? So it's an argument that's going to rage on. I think a happy medium is uh, what I think everybody would love. And, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, the joke that we make is, hey, we don't care where you're from. As long as they continue to beat Michigan, everything's okay. Yeah, I liken it to a certain extent uh, uh, to the criticism thrown at uh, the great Dallas Cowboys coach Tom Landry in that he built a system in Dallas that ensured basically because of his genius that he had this system and structure in place that just spit out playoff contenders and playoff and, and Super Bowl contenders, I should say, that played in five Super Bowls and all 
just went to championship games like it was nothing. Actually, Bill Belichick just broke his uh, NFL record for NFC or conference championship games played in. But the criticism was maybe they got to a Super Bowl in an NFC championship game. And while the other team was fighting like it was the end of the world, uh, his team was just going out there like it was just another game uh, because that's what they did. They were businesslike and that built consistent excellence, but maybe they didn't quite uh, push a few through. Yeah, I know at Ohio State they talk about competitive excellence and they build these championship teams in the spring, the summer, and certainly in the fall because it is the best of the best going against each other in practice. And, uh, you know, I think what we saw over the course of the season was Ohio State's defense by the end of the year was marginally better, some, somewhat improved. I think you could take that Maryland game and tear it in half and throw both halves away, 51 points. They gave up in a winning effort, <laughs> but um, otherwise, uh, you know, there were at least some better signs that uh, uh, by the end of the year that going against Ohio State's offense and the offenses that they were playing against had improved them a little bit. Um, I think Ohio State fans are excited to see what new direction they're going to go with this new staff. And obviously you have as many as nine guys. My tally when I did it yesterday, Mark, was – Four guys who we would traditionally say on offense are returning starters, plus K.J. Hill, who was rarely listed as a starter but was a leading receiver the last two years, and Brandon Bowen, who was a starter in 2017 but didn't play in 2018. So you have as many as six guys on that side of the ball with starting experience and nine on defense uh, with starting experience. And uh, the two guys you lose both went pro early. It was uh, Kendall Sheffield at corner and Draymond Jones at defensive tackle. Everybody else is back, and you just hope uh, between the new staff and uh, the experience that those guys had, the lessons that they learned, that uh, that it'll be a much better uh, situation. And again, as I said, um, you know, going against the best every day in practice is what they kind of bill as uh, the, the one of the secrets to their success. And one of the oddest resumes in college football from last season was the Maryland Terps who beat Texas and came within a catch in the end zone of beating, beating Ohio State. So they, in fact, could have beaten two of the top seven or eight teams in the country, but uh, couldn't make a bowl game. <laughs> so uh, they hit a high ceiling, a lot of speed, and we'll see what uh, Michael Loxley can do there in College Park. Uh, Steve, you've been extremely gracious with your time. We appreciate you stopping by. Uh, of course, join Steve and the rest of the staff at Bucknuts at 247 Sports, and we'll have Steve back as soon as we possibly can. Steve, we appreciate you stopping by, sir. All right, Mark. Take care.